Good morning, Front Street. I hope you are doing well today. I want to welcome you to our corporate virtual worship gathering. Uh, we're thankful to have this opportunity to be able to stream our services and be able to still come together and worship even though we can't physically be together. Uh, we are celebrating today the birth of uh, Benjamin Archer Scora, Troy and Jennifer uh, welcomed their baby boy this past Monday night, so we celebrate with them. He came into the world weighing 9 pounds, 5 ounces, 21 inches long, and a head full of hair. More hair than I've probably had in my entire life. So, Scora family, we love you guys. We are uh, thankful and celebrate with you, and we lift you in prayer. Uh, we want to remember to pray for the Beaver family. We want to pray for uh, Miss Mary Wiles, for Mike Johnson. We want to pray for Miss uh, Norma Hellard. Uh, so many in our church are facing battles with cancer and different health issues. We uh, have people in our church that are still uh, going through the grieving process. We have people in our community that are, are on the front lines battling the coronavirus. Aren't you thankful that we have a God that we can come before and humbly submit our requests, knowing that in His sovereignty, in His power, and in His goodness, uh, that he is taking care of each of us and we can trust him with our future. So with that being said, how about we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we welcome your presence into this place today. God, we ask you through your Holy Spirit to come and to speak deeply into our hearts. We thank you, God, for uh, your presence. We thank you for your power. We thank you that we have a God who is sovereign, who is all-knowing, who is uh, just omni, omnipresent. He is omnipotent. There, God, you are so incredibly awesome, and there's so many reasons to worship you and celebrate you today uh, that I pray that our hearts will just overflow with worship. God, thank you for uh, allowing us to lift up our request to you. We, we celebrate the birth of uh, Benjamin Score. Lord, we pray even today that when he... Uh, comes to the age that he's able to understand the gospel, that, that, that even that day that he would trust you as Lord and Savior. We pray you would have your hand on his life. God, we pray for uh, all those that we mentioned that are, are battling cancer, those who are uh, walking through grief, those who are ministering within our community. We pray for your hand of protection, your hand of healing, your, your power to strengthen their spirit. God, we love you and we commit this service to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, as uh, hopefully you received in the mail this week or through email, you see that we are planning to reopen the church on June 7th. That's our target date. If you did not receive that letter, you can go to our website, and at the very top of the website, there's a, a block there that says the plan for reopening uh, the facility come in June 7th. So I encourage you to go read that, and a uh, lot's going to go into that, but we look forward to finally being able, at least in some sense, to regather as the body of Christ at Front Street. Let's worship together. Good morning. Welcome to Front Street. We're glad you're here to worship with us. Join in and sing to our God. He is great and greatly to be praised. Come, let us worship our King. Let us bow at His feet. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven. You conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. He's done great things today. Let's praise Him. He is worthy. You've been faithful to every soul. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. 
And I know you will do it again For your promise is yes and amen You will do great things God, you do great things Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave You free every captive and break every chain Let's praise Him, sing hallelujah to Him. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah. Every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. You have done great things.
of God. Be lifted higher. Be lifted higher than all you've overcome. Your name be louder than any other song. There is no power that can come against your love. The cross was enough. The cross was enough. The cross was enough. The cross was enough. On the altar of our praise, let there be no higher name. Jesus, Son of God. Down your perfect life, you are the sacrifice, Jesus, Son of God. On the altar, on the altar of our praise, let there be no higher name, Jesus, Son of God. You lay down your perfect life. You are the sacrifice, Jesus, Son of God. You are Jesus, Son of God. Be lifted higher than all you've overcome. Your name be louder than any other song. There is no power that can come against your love. The cross was enough. The cross was enough. Be lifted higher than all you've overcome. Your name be louder than any other song. There is no The cross was enough to be lifted higher than all you've overcome. Your name be louder than any other song. There is no power that can come against your love. The cross was enough. The cross was enough. The cross was enough, the cross was enough, the cross was enough, the cross was Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay, set my feet upon the rock, and now I know I love you. Lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the mire and clay, set my feet upon the rock, and now I know. I will worship 
January 8, 1956, the world was shocked to learn of five missionaries who had set out to share the gospel with the Alka Indians in Ecuador, to learn that those five missionaries, before they ever got the chance to share the gospel, uh, were killed by those very people that they had gone to reach. And I'm sure as word about that spread around the world, it raised a lot of questions. People would question, you know, why would, why would God allow this to happen? Why would these men who had devoted their life to preparing for missions and preparing to, uh, to serve God, and then they, on, on this uh, first trip, to, to actually meet with and talk with and have an opportunity to share the gospel with a people that they deeply cared about. I mean, their lives were just taken, and, you know, what, was it really worth it? You know, when... When we think about how the world viewed that, there's a limitless number of possibilities of how people viewed that experience. But what about their families? What about the wives and the young children that they left behind? Many of us are familiar with the story of Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, these other men and, and their wives and, and what happened after that. But two women... Elizabeth Elliot, Jim's wife, and Rachel Saint, Nate's wife, just a little over about two and a half years after their husband's death, they moved into the very village where their husbands were killed. Elizabeth Elliot, her, her daughter was 10 months old when her husband was killed. So when she moved into that village, she moved into that village with a three-year-old into a place that was incredibly dangerous, a place that her husband had already lost his life. She moved there, and she stayed there for two years as she shared the gospel with these people who were known as the most violent and deadly people on the face of the earth. Rachel Saint stayed there from 1958 until her death in 1994. She spent the rest of her life sharing the gospel with and ministering to the very people that took her husband's life. In fact, the first man that actually came to faith in that village was the man who speared her husband. How would they respond in such a way as this? You know, I don't think anybody would have blamed them if they had come away from the, the tragic experience of losing their husbands, of saying, I, I don't understand this. Why did God allow this to happen? Is, is He not all-powerful? Could He not control this situation? If He is all-powerful, then He must not care. He must not care about me. He must not care about my young daughter. He must not care about these men who devoted their life for Him. You see, when we enter into times of pain and suffering and times of crisis... What it does is it reveals our true convictions. You know, convictions are more than just beliefs we hold. Convictions are those beliefs which hold us. And for Elizabeth Elliot and Rachel Saint, what you saw was their convictions that God is good, that God is sovereign, that God is worthy of our worship, and that the gospel of Jesus Christ is too important to hold back even from those who took the life of their spouse. The same is true for us. As we think about our lives, when we go through times of crisis, and probably we've not experienced anything quite like that, but in our own ways, we've experienced times of crisis. We've experienced times of suffering. We've experienced times of pain. And through those times of crisis and pain, it revealed something about our core beliefs, our convictions. Not what we say we believe, not what we even think we believe. It reveals what we truly believe. Today we're going to be in Genesis chapter 45. 
we are finally getting to the part of the story in the life of Joseph where we see reconciliation. And we are going to we're going to see in this story that for Joseph, uh, this isn't something that came about quick. You know, we started this series nine weeks ago, and some of you have been like, come on, let's get to the part where Joseph gets restored to his brothers. Let's feel good, because we're, I mean, let's face it, we're, we're used to watching a movie or a TV show that within an hour or two hours, we go from life is good to something terrible happens, and then at the end, it's all resolved and everything's good again. And that is not how any of us live our life, and it certainly wasn't for Joseph. I think if Joseph could have known he could have gone through this in nine weeks, I think he would have said, sign me up. Because we realized that from the time that, that we started this series, when we were looking at the, Joseph's brother selling him into slavery, somewhere around 23 years had passed. And now here he is face to face. Through that 23 years, Joseph had no clue from the beginning how things were going to turn out. He went through heartache after heartache, disaster after disaster, crisis after crisis, pain after pain. And yet at the end of the day, as he has this opportunity to face his brothers, to reveal himself to them, this is, this is your brother Joseph, we will see in his response his convictions we will see those core beliefs that truly hold his life. As we look at his response, then we will say, okay, so what was the core conviction of his life? What was it that allowed him to respond in the way that he did? Let's, let's pray together before we open up God's Word here. Father, we pause before you right now, and we, we thank you that we have your word. We thank you that you have truth to communicate to each of us today. Lord, each of us can identify with Joseph on some level because we have all been through times where we were, we were mistreated. We've gone through times where we have faced uh, false accusations. We've gone through times that we were betrayed by those who were supposed to love us, care for us, protect us. God, we have gone through times where we've experienced loss, we've experienced grief, we've experienced pain, we've experienced uncertainty. So we can identify with Him in that. Lord, I pray that as we look at His response, and as we uncover ultimately that core conviction that You are a good and sovereign God, that we will be able to reflect on our own lives to look at our core beliefs, what are our actual convictions. I pray that your Spirit would reveal to us the, the depths of what it is we believe. And if we are off in any way, shape, or form in our beliefs, if, if they are beliefs that we hold lightly, that beliefs that don't hold us, I pray that you would reveal that so that we can turn away from that and put our faith completely and wholly in you and you alone. So God, speak to us through your Word. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you will, turn with me to Genesis 45, and uh, we're going to break this up into three sections, and we're going to read them individually. So uh, first we're going to read verses 1 through the first part of verse 5. God's Word says, Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now... Do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. The first thing we notice about the response of Joseph is that he extended genuine forgiveness to his brothers. Genuine forgiveness to his brothers. 
Think about the emotion of this moment. Think about all that he had experienced, all the time he had to think about what his brothers had done to him in Egypt, how they had sold him into slavery, and, and how all these things had happened in his life that started right there. And, and he had 23, at least 23, somewhere around 23 years that he could have been building up animosity and hatred and, and all of these things toward his brother. And this could be his opportunity to unload on them but that is not at all what happened. Think about the heaviness, the emotion of this moment as Joseph sends everybody out of the room. You remember when we left off last week, um, Benjamin had been caught with his cup and, and he had told the brothers, hey, he's going to have to stay here. The rest of you are going to go home. He's going to be my slave here. And, and Judah stepped up and said, no, I, I'll give my life for his. Let me be your slave. Let him go home to his father. And it was in that moment that, that Joseph saw that there had been a genuine change, that Judah wasn't willing to sell out his brother. In fact, he was willing to give his own life for him. And so Joseph responds by telling everybody else to leave the room. You know, you know the brothers have to be wondering what's about to happen. What's going to happen if, if all these people are gone? Here's the person uh, second only to Pharaoh in Egypt, and, and it's just us and him. And he sends all of them out, and he begins to weep, and he reveals to them, I am Joseph. Can you imagine what the brothers must have thought in that moment? I would think that there is one just of being dumbstruck first. Wait a minute, we sold you into slavery. How in the world could you have become the second most powerful person in Egypt? But I can't help but to believe that there was an incredible amount of fear here. Because they recognized that we sold him into slavery. He's the second most powerful person in Egypt. He can have done to us whatever he wants. But notice how he responds. Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. Now understand that that in the Hebrew, uh, there's, there's a richness here to these words that in English, we can, we can read this and we can think this could be Joseph saying, hey, get over here, guys. Let me lay into you right now. But that is not at all what has taken place here. When he says, please come near to me, this is an invitation into relationship. Jo Joseph is not saying, come here and let me lecture you. He's saying, come here and be in relationship with me. That is absolutely not possible unless forgiveness has taken place. We can see this in our own relationship with the Father. You know, every sin that we've ever committed is sinned against the Father. Even sins we commit against other people ultimately is sin against God. And every sin that, that we've sinned against Him... He loved us in spite of that sin and sent His only begotten Son so that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. He sent His Son so that we could be forgiven. God sent Jesus in this world so that we could be forgiven. And just like with Joseph's brothers, you know, Joseph sent them through all this all of these tests, and he realized through that that they weren't the same people, that they had regrets over what they had done to him, that they, they recognized that they had sinned against God. And for all who recognize that, that our sin is against God, that God has sent his son into this world to die for my sin. He paid the penalty, the price for my sin. And that by believing in Him, asking for forgiveness, acknowledging my sin, we can be brought back into a right relationship with God. We can be reconciled to Almighty God. Joseph was able to forgive his brothers because they had come to the place that they recognized their sin. And here he demonstrates that forgiveness by inviting them into a, a relationship with them. Come near to me. I want to put my hands on you. I want to hug your neck. I want to embrace you. I want to give you a kiss and tell you that I love you, that you are my brothers, that you are forgiven. This is absolutely incredible. And he says in verse 5, he says, But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. You see, Joseph he recognized that, uh, that, that these guys, they would have been 
uh, filled with grief and with shame, and, and they realized that what they had done to him was a horrible thing. And it would have been very easy for Joseph to say, uh, you know, guys, you should feel bad. I mean, think about it. When somebody hurts us, it's natural for us to want them to at least experience some pain. We want them to feel guilt over what they've done. We, it's not right for them just to be completely forgiven and everything to be okay, right? I mean, they need to, to suffer a little bit. You don't see any of this with Joseph. Even though around 23 years had passed, this is the first encounter that they understand who he is. And this is his first time speaking to them as their brother. And here what we see is a genuine forgiveness that, that not only do I want you to come into relationship, I don't want you to feel the guilt. I don't want you to feel the shame. I don't want you to be weighed down by that. I want you to know that you are completely forgiven. Church, let me ask you this morning. Can you say that about all the relationships in your life? Can you say that there's nobody in this, in this world that you're not still a little bitter with, that you're not still holding a grudge, that you've been unwilling to forgive. You know, when God forgives us, He forgives us of all of our sin, past, present, and future. And He calls us to forgive others. And when we refuse to forgive, that bitterness that wells up inside of us becomes a cancer within our own life that eats away at us. It destroys us from the inside out. You know, you can see here in Joseph, this response is not a typical response. This is not a worldly response. This response shows that there is a man here that has a deep-seated conviction, a belief that there's something bigger here going on than him. And he is able to genuinely forgive his brothers. If you've got somebody in your life today that you have not genuinely forgiven... I want to encourage you to, to cry out to God and to say, God, I want to be able to forgive as you have forgiven me. I don't deserve your forgiveness. They don't deserve your forgiveness. We need it, God. The second thing we're going to notice about Joseph, his second response, is that he acknowledged God's sovereign plan. Look at the end of verse 5. It says, For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to, pre to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. You know, here as, as Joseph begins to console his brothers and, and he's expressing that he is forgiving them, he is also acknowledging that, that there's something bigger him, something bigger there than a story about him. He recognizes that, that all along the way, uh, these moments are really not his story, that there's a much bigger story in play, and it's the story of God. And, and he's not saying to his brothers that you're not guilty, that you're not responsible for your actions. He's not saying that at all. Uh, you will hear him say, you meant this for evil, God meant it for good. But what he is saying is that through all of this, he is able to see that God's hand was on him, and that God was working through these, these incredibly difficult circumstances so that, that in the end, God had Joseph exactly where he wanted him to do exactly what he had called and prepared him to do. It's truly an incredible story. I mean, when we think about this over these 20 years and all the things that happened in Joseph's life... He, he didn't know, he didn't think, when he was sitting in the pit after his brothers threw him in there, he didn't say, wow, you know, this really stinks, but you know what, I know what God's going to do. God's going to take me into Egypt, and he's going to make me second only to Pharaoh, and all this is going to work out. He didn't know how things were going to turn out, but all along the way, he had a trust that God is sovereign, that God is good, that God has a plan, that he is working for his own good, and I'm part of that plan, and I will trust him. You know, Joseph could look back over his life at any point and say, you know what, if my brothers had never sold me into slavery, I wouldn't have ended up in Egypt. If I hadn't have been in Egypt, I wouldn't have been in Potiphar's house. If I hadn't have been accused of rape by Potiphar's wife, 
I never would have been in prison. If I had never been in prison, I never would have met the cupbearer. If I had never met the cupbearer, I could have never interpreted his dream. If the cupbearer hadn't forgotten me when he got out of prison and went back before Pharaoh, I wouldn't have still been in prison when Pharaoh needed a dream interpreted. And if I had not been in prison went to interpret that dream for Pharaoh, I would be dead, my family would be dead, the whole known world would be in crisis because we would be in a famine that we were absolutely not prepared for. You see, Joseph, even though he didn't know how all this was going to work out, he didn't ultimately know what God's plan was. He knew that God was sovereign, God was in control, and that God had a plan. It's so easy for us when we get into pain and when we get into suffering and when we get into difficulty for us to be so stained by that that we, we become completely self-focused. Uh, uh, this inward focus leads to a place where we, where we feel self-pity, and it's all about, oh, poor me, and what's happened to me. And that's not to minimize any of our pain. Some of us have gone through incredibly difficult, painful experiences. But when we fail to acknowledge the sovereign hand of God and His plan, then we, we get in this place that everything is about us. And while we wouldn't say it out loud, ultimately what we believe is that God exists for us rather than us for God. And it's about God is supposed to be there to fulfill my plan rather than seeing that God is sovereign over all and His plan is over all and He has called us and allowed us to be part of His plan and what He's doing. This is truly an incredible story. Joseph says to his brothers in verse 8, he says, So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. Y'all know, this is, these are two of my favorite words in Scripture. It's not y'all who sent me here. Does that mean they're not responsible for that? No, they did send him there. They did place him in a pit in Egypt, and they are responsible for that. But he's saying in, 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 in light of what you've done, God has done something greater. You did this, but look at what God has done. God has put me in, in the house of Pharaoh and Lord of all the house and ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Now I want you to back up to verse 7. And he says to him, And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So Joseph is saying to him, You did this, but look at what God did. God put me in the house of Pharaoh. Why did God put me in the house of Pharaoh? To preserve a posterity for you in the earth. What does that mean, to preserve a posterity? It means that He has reserved a future for you. You meant this for evil. You wanted me dead. You wanted me gone. But God has reserved a posterity for you, a future for you in this earth. And guess what? It's not just about you. It's about you, and it's about your children, and it's about your children's children, and it's about my Father, and it's about ultimately the redemptive history. Because this would be the group through which the Messiah would come. This is much bigger than a story just about Joseph and his brothers being reconciled. This is a story much bigger than God just sparing the lives of his brothers. This is God preserving the seed through which the Messiah would come. And church, that is something that we absolutely celebrate today. And we see God's hand at work. But it's a lot more difficult when we're looking at the pain and suffering in our own lives. Because we want to see now, God, what are you doing? I don't see how you're going to work in this circumstance. I, this is a horrific situation that I'm in, and I don't see how in any way, shape, or form you can use this for your good. And even if you could, God, I really don't want to be part of it. If we're honest, there are probably times that that's where we find ourselves. You know, for Joseph, he was able to acknowledge God's plan's greater than my life. God's plan's greater than my comfort. God's plan is greater than my security. God's plan is greater than absolutely everything else. And I'm going to stay focused on God's plan. How in the world could he do that? It comes back to his faith. It is rooted in the fact that God is sovereign and that God is good. 
what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God is in control. Church, as you look at your life experiences, you look at your pain, you look at your suffering, there may be places that you look at it and you say, I don't see the hand of God here. If I could just see what He's doing right now, then I, I could feel better about this or maybe I could work through it. You know, we like for things to, as we go through them, we like for them to end quickly. 23 years before He gets resolution. There may be things that we go through in this life that are painful that we will not know on this side of eternity how God used them for His purpose. But we believe the Word of God in Romans 8, 28 where He says, and, and God works all things together for good to those who love Christ, to those who are called according to His purpose. We can trust Him and acknowledge that God is working His sovereign plan in all of this world around us. He is working at, not, this is not about me. This is not about my life or my life plan. This is about Him. And we can trust Him. The final thing we see here is we see that His response is one of sacrificially providing for His brothers. Look at verse 9. He says, Hurry and go to my father, and to say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me, and your children, and your children's children, your flocks, and your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is in my mouth that speaks to you. You see, in, that, in those verses, Joseph tells his brothers, I want you to go back home, and I want you to get your father, and I want you to get your, your, your children, your children's children, and I want you to get your flocks, and I want you to get your herd, and, and look at what he says in verse 11, and he says, There I will provide for you. Now, if you're familiar with the rest of the story, and we don't have time to get into that today, uh, when Pharaoh hears about this, Pharaoh sends everything to go with Joseph. He, he sends chariots, and he sends food, and he sends all this, and, and provides very well for Joseph's family. But that's not, Joseph doesn't realize that's going to happen. And he says, I will provide for you. The very people that sold him into slavery to make money off of him, the very people that told his father he was dead, the very people that he sought to get rid of, he says, I will sacrificially give of myself so that you will have food to eat your children your children's children will have food to eat and I will bring you back and I will provide for you so that you will not only survive this famine that you will thrive even though there's five years left you're going to thrive through this Joseph's actions reveal this conviction that he believes God is sovereign and that he believes God is good God is sovereign, and God is good. What do you believe, church? What are your core convictions? You know, we, we gather in here, and we worship, and we sing songs of praise, and you know what? It, it's pretty easy to sing, God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good. It's easy to sing that when we're not in pain. It's easy to sing that when we're not suffering. But can we sing that when we're standing at the graveside? Can we sing that when somebody that we love with all of our hearts just betrayed us? Can we sing that when the doctor says the report's not good? Can we sing that when your career of 30 years is snatched away from you? Can you sing that when you've lost everything? What of your trials? What of your suffering? What have they revealed to you about your core convictions? You know, next week we are going to be looking at Genesis chapter 50, and we are going to focus on this core belief of Joseph that God is good and God is sovereign, and we're going to explore what that means. Because, to be honest, we're living in a time where we need to understand that. Right now, 
We're not in the time of prosperity. Right now, we're not in a time of certainty. We don't know what tomorrow looks like. We don't know what next month or next year looks like. Almost every single person I know, they're facing some kind of uncertainty. What does it mean to to believe God is sovereign, that He's in control? As you've gone through trials, what has been your default? Has it been an accusatory point at God and saying, God, you're either all, not all-powerful, or if you are all-powerful, you're not all-loving, you're not all-good, because you wouldn't have allowed this to happen? Or can you honestly say, God, this hurts. I'm in pain. I don't like this situation, but I trust you. Can you say that today? You know, as we move into a time of response, I want to challenge you. If you recognize that your convictions, those foundational beliefs, that they waver, that there's some cracks there, that they're not exactly what they need to be, I want to challenge you to to confess that to the Lord and to ask Him, Help me, Lord. I hear people say all the time, I'm no theologian. And I want you to know that is a lie. The decisions you make every day, the decisions you make when things are good, and the decisions you make when things are bad, are directly related to your core convictions, your beliefs. Every one of us is a a theologian. Some of us have really bad theology. If that's you today, confess that to the Lord and say, God, I need help. I'm struggling in my belief. Help me to understand who you are. Help me to understand your sovereignty and your goodness. If you've never trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you to do that today. Come to Him and confess, I'm a sinner and I'm in need of your saving grace. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross in my place. I believe He rose from the dead from the third day. And I believe that by placing my life in your hands, signing over control, it was a false control anyway. God, you are ultimately in control. I thought I was, but I recognize that. And I surrender to you and say, here I am, Lord. Here's my life. Forgive me of my sin. I place my trust and faith in you. And I ask you to to take my life and lead me from this point forward. If you've never done that, will you do it today? Let's pray. Father, as we humble ourselves before you right now, we pray that as we have a time to sing and respond to you, that God, you will reveal to us exactly what we need to do. Lord, I pray for those who have never trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, that right now they would turn to you. Right now they would trust you. Right now they would seek your forgiveness and place their faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Lord, for those of us who may be struggling in our theology, maybe have some bad theology, maybe have ourself at the center of our theology rather than you, I pray that we would confess that today, that we would turn away from it, that we would repent and place our trust in a sovereign and good God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together, church. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you are condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, amazing love. My King would die for me. Amazing love, I know is true. It's my joy to honor you. Amazing love. Amazing love, how can it be? 
true, my King would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. Sing that with me. I'm forgiven because you are forsaken. I'm accepted, you are condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you. Amazing love. Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. He's our King. Let's worship Him today. Jesus, you're our King. You. Thank you for joining us for worship today. God bless you all. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon. We're praying for you. We love you. Come back and see us next week at 1030 next Sunday morning, the 31st. God bless.